strawberries. Yeah, that's not how it is. And exotic fruit. <laughs> Buy it. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. No problems. We knew you were coming. So, Mr. Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? We have one change to the agenda, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's an added private confidential document. It's respecting the electronic recording of closed session minutes uh, and communications. And that, that is also the case. So, that is item 4.3. So we will move in camera, we'll, we'll set that aside, move in camera to get the advice and then move back into open session for the uh, um, subsequent discussion. Uh, any other additions to the agenda, members of the committee? Um, I would like under other business to add the item additional membership on committees. It'll be a OBL to deal with in the future, but not to raise it. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Clark and Pasud on the motion. All those in favor? Carried. Carried. Any declarations of interest? None are noted. You have before you the minutes of our October the 30th. What's the pleasure of the committee? Moved by Pasud. Seconded by Clark. Mm -hmm. On the motion. All those in favor? Carried. Carried. Discussion items 4.1. Uh, disclosure of expenses and of council and senior staff. This is an item that was raised by Councillor Clark, and uh, so who's going to be the lead on this one? I can start off, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, staff have done some um, research in terms of uh, there's actually three municipalities that uh, currently uh, provide this information: City of Toronto, Mississauga, and Ottawa. Um, and there is a template that we use. And uh, there was some interest with some members of the committee wanting to uh, get started putting up uh, this information. I, I would suggest that uh, uh, we don't do one-off steps. That either all members of the council do it um, instead of doing a single councils at a time. So it's up for discussion. Um, there is some information that uh, um, Lisa researched in terms of. Uh, some things you might want to think about is by policy. There is no bylaw. I know Councillor Clark, you thought there were some bylaws that this was established by, but it's actually by by policy. Uh, the council's adopted a policy on it. So if you'd like some work done on uh, a policy, uh, would have might have some implications with um, staffing, uh, um, how how you put the information up, like the the collecting of it and, and, and posting it to the website as well. Yeah. The. Uh Information you're referring to, Ms. Caterini, is on page five of mm -hmm. the uh, other report. Councilor Clark, over to you. Um, the policy, how do we ensure that the policy has teeth to ensure enforcement of it? Do we know? Lisa? No. If we set a policy, I, I thought Toronto had a bylaw, so there was no choice they were going to deal with it. So how, how do we ensure that the policy has teeth that the council just says, I'm not going to do it? Uh, uh, Toronto's policy is 120 pages long. So yeah, they're it's, boring. <laughs> um, I mean, it's at the will of council, and if you choose to make a stronger statement by way of bylaw, then that's what you would choose. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's, from what I've researched, it's not been done. The, the code of conduct does require and then were there any of the three municipalities where the elected officials were entering the data themselves into in essence a uh, I'm thinking like a, a spreadsheet that's on a computer you'd enter in the data and you submit and when you submit it now goes on screen so it's not legal their staff's responsibility to duplicate that data it's actually the counselor has to do this once a month or the counselor staff does it once a month and once they hit submit it's it's up on the screen and then they're responsible for any dyslexic errors copies now a thousand dollars or something staff that I spoke to, uh, there was no indication that uh, councillors were prepping any of the information um, prior to it being posted. Wow. That's a lot 
duplication in this modern tech world. And how justifiably quickly could we, in essence, adopt a policy and get this online two years out from the next election now? I'd personally like to see it in place at least for the last year of this term so that they, you know, that, I mean, I have absolutely no problems at all in disclosing Details of my expenditures, but if we were to, I say, finesse the the policy and 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 the things that you've outlined here, Ms. Caterini, in your in your report, we could probably have the thing uh, ready to go online for two thousand fourteen. January. Yeah, yeah, January two thousand and fourteen is, is is my thinking. But I'm just trying to figure. They're also. Uh, Mr. Mayo, I invite you to uh, you know, to come as well in case there's any concerns from the um, AP side of posting and collecting the information. Um, there are, there's also that second piece of uh, the expenses for uh, senior staff as well. We uh, have discussed that was part mm -hmm. of the original motion. So um, don't think any discussions um, with anyone at SMP to provide any information or comment on that. We haven't. Uh, um. I don't know if SMT has actually even contemplated it. I know they already monitor the stuff, but in my opinion, if the elected officials are going to be doing it, so should be the senior team. That's just me. The challenge is that you get these bizarre Rob Ford affairs that grab all the media attention. Um, we do everything right. We just kind of like this. Let's keep it like that, but let's make sure everything's recorded. You hear from, I guess it was two years ago, it was all over the American media, the, the uh, congressmen were buying $16 muffins. And that was the norm, because one dumbass congressman bought a $16 muffin and became the norm. Well, you can uh, avoid all of that stuff by simply showing what your expenses are for a trip. If you're going, if we're headed off to India uh, to procure business, then we record all of our expenses while we're there, and we come back and we make that report public. And it becomes a part of a web page. Prevents any allegations and prevents, everyone expects us to do what we would do at home. So we should be doing it that way, straight up. That'd be my opinion, but. So I think direction, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to tie in the, in the conversation. I, I think there are, Sorry, Councilor Brasuda, before I say No, I, I, I agree with uh, both yourself and Mr. Chair and Councilor Clark that, uh, you know, let's be straightforward and open because even my business home, I can't hide anything. Everything is so goes through and there's a fee taken off of marketing. We can't hide anything. So, I mean, I'm used to being straight up and forward. So, I, I, I think perhaps is we certainly could, in other words, Council, by example, could start this. We could ask the issue for senior staff to be referred to Mr. Mr. Murray. I mean, there's probably no reason why the senior staff shouldn't be part of this, but out of courtesy, I think we share it with, uh, ask Mr. Murray to put it on an SMT meeting in that, and, uh, and I would think well, that. I, I agree, but Mr. Murray, is, as I recall, went down to visit with Brian Beamish, and um, I, every single privacy commissioner in the, in the country has proactive disclosure for all of their staff. And so we talked about it when I was there. So I don't think Chris is going to be opposed to it. I, and I don't want to leave the impression that they may have a difference of opinion. Because when we talked about proactive disclosure and we went down and talked about um, access by design and privacy by design, which are two different paradigms, but the proactive disclosure is exactly what we're talking about here. So elected officials, um, SMT, and when we develop the policy, we can sit down and say, well, how far down the line do we go? And I candidly, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how many people um, have expenses um, of this type, except for the elected and senior management team. Um, but if it gets lower than that, you may have to actually have it done in a manner that each division has to do their own once a year also. 
um, but it should most certainly, um, the policy should be developed in this year. And with not the stated goal, it has to be implemented by um, January 1. And, and I have no objections to including senior staff. I mean, it's, it's a recommendation from us that will uh, that will go to the appropriate committee and then on the council. So uh, this will be, Ms. Cantori will ensure that uh, Mr. Murray to this, and if there's an issue, we'll hear about it between now and when it finds its way to committee or finds its way to, uh, to, to council. But I think if we were to approve a motion kind of on that direction, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking that the report should be uh, a minimum of semi-annually. Semi so, I mean, in other words, part of the report would be, I mean, if we set up the template, the thing could be an ongoing live live one that's kind of evolving as the as the expenses are, 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 are done. So, so perhaps we give the direction, Councillor Clark, and uh, with, with elements of the, uh, of uh, what's laid out here on, on the uh, page five. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I would move that we would give direction to staff to develop a policy for the proactive disclosure of expenses because we're not talking about FOI, we're talking about proactive disclosure of expenses um, to develop a standard format uh, so that the information can be used on the website. Um, the policy should speak to the, the, uh, the duration, the number of quarterly, monthly, whatever it is, frequency, frequency, thank you. And then council can decide at that point. I'm like you, monthly is fine, doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. um, consider staffing requirements, but we want to do it at the least expensive way possible. So I kind of like the idea of having the councils do the work themselves. And I know, because I've done it in other organizations, you can do it on, online. And then the budget implications, obviously, sir. That would have to come back to us now. If we're planning on having this implemented for January first, which is a part of the you know to be to be implemented by January first, so we would need the report back to GIC for approval in I would say the end of June to allow for a six month implementation. Yes. This can, uh, Mr. Chantry, this can uh, reports up through AFA. Okay, yeah, okay. So if, if we take six months to develop the policy and work back and forth, then we would have six months to implement. Does that make sense or more time would be required? Because we're kind of boring and begging from others. Well, why don't we leave it that it's in your investigation? So in yeah. other words, you're going to have, your, you know, starting Basically, starting now, you've got seven months, and you'll find out early in the process if there's hiccups, and we encourage you to come back to us sooner rather than later if there's something you uh, you, you need us to get involved in. And I believe your motion included the all members of city council and and senior staff. Correct. That's in the direction. Okay. Anyone further on the item? Okay, on a motion, I want to thank our staff for doing all the, because we knew that it was out there, it was just it's a challenge for us sometimes to do the research ourselves, so thank you for pulling together. Okay, so on a motion by Councillor Carr, and second by Councillor Prosuda, the direction has been uh, um, given in the way of a motion, so on the motion, all those in favor? Carried. Opposed? The motion is carried. Um, item 4.2 is a review of process for private and confidential reports. There is a recommendation before us, and that recommendation states that the city clerks be directed to amend the City of Hamilton agenda template as attached in Appendix B for all committees and council agendas to reflect under the private and confidential section the reasons relied on under the Ontario Municipal Act and City's procedural bylaw for which committee or council will consider a particular matter in closed session. Sir? Just a, a question. And, um, do we have the ability to um, have
have the confidential or somewhere up here where it's actually drilled right through the paper, the word confidential. The watermark? It's not the, yeah, the watermark is what we're using right now, where you can actually drill through the paper. Braille embossing? It's, it's no, it's, um, I'm yeah. thinking about Privy Council um, documents and, and Executive Council documents. The big fear was it just because it's stamped like cover, it's, it's like this, um, doesn't mean that someone's not going to try and find a way around it to get the document out and about. Whereas you can't possibly make a mistake that if there's holes in it, then that document is not meant for public. I've, I've seen the things. It's, it's, it's basically little, uh, there's little spikes that go in and, and they basically design the whole thing and you just pull the handle right down of it and it goes, every it, document it, it, it probably it goes through every page in that and, uh, and I've seen the confidential as Councillor Carter referred to, I saw it in, uh, so in my, as in my federal to, life. Yeah, I, uh, as opposed to trying to do everything in red paper which sometimes is difficult to read. Um, the one solution is that there can actually just, it's, it's a drill document. And so confidential is drilled right through it. So you pick it up, you can actually see across the room and every page is marked. Something to contemplate. Because we have run into is issues a couple of times now in camera where we can't read a document because it's on red paper. So I think we have two items here. One, and one of them is is the approval of the template. So in other words, the revision that's being proposed for the template. And then, uh, Councillor Carr, I would enter, entertain a part B, which would be that uh, the, the staff uh, in, in investigate um, uh, further options for securing the confidentiality of the actual document. Mm -hmm. So good. So you to move this as a, a part A, part B motion? Yep. Okay. Yep. Second by Councillor Pasuda. Barbara, anything on the motion? Okay. Okay. Lisa, anything on the, your um, and Mary's report? Okay. All in favor? Carried. Opposed? The motion is carried. Um, item to do 4.4 and then we'll move in uh, camera to deal with the uh, confidential. So quorum at I gotta tell you, I had a heck of a time reading through this thing and comprehended. I kind of got charts going. I'm sure you had a lot of fun writing it. I threw the chair and returned to my university logic course. <laughs> and then it failed, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. After you, after you defaulted to your logic, you wrote the report here, and you. And you so four point four was complicated. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I must be in that meeting. So for the chair of the committee, the answer is yes. <laughs> Yeah, but now I'm a member from Ward 9, no problem. I looked at quorum generally and tried to provide you with a roadmap about how quorum may be lost mm -hmm. and how matters may proceed when it is. And the roadmap applies to quorum at standing committees as well as at council, keeping in mind that if a standing committee is left with on only a court proceeding to attain quorum, council could take the matter up before you resort. Um, the key is knowing what causes the loss, loss of corn. You have to know what puts you in that position. So it could be a pecuniary interest, an absence, or a non-pecuniary interest. And how you may proceed is determined by which one is causing your loss of corn. So that's explained in the report. Um, if the loss of corn is due to a pecuniary interest, then corn can be reduced to two. And with recourse to the court, if it's less than two. If it's due to an absence, the matter can be postponed to remedy that. If it's due to a non-pecuniary interest, then the recourse is to a court under a civil proceeding that I cited. Um, just note in that section, when I read it through today, the number nine in that section should be eight. Because it shifted to the number that are absent. I apologize for that. Here. So that's basically uh, what is before you. And it, it is intended to be a road map of sorts when you find yourselves facing a deficiency of corn. But isn't the simplest solution just to recess the meeting and then proceed to the next available date? 
and that is in the report as well, that council will always be mindful that you have that solution before you if you need it. This, is, I, I, this I, is when you're in position that you can't, because eight of you have a pecuniary interest, which hasn't, uh, through the chair, hasn't been faced here, but some other municipalities have no region of Waterloo have been facing some issues where they have a majority of the councillors are faced with a pecuniary interest on their light bracket transit. But they're coming close. Mm -hmm. So in most instances, well, we have to hope that everyone's in their mind. <laughs> in most instances, certainly can be remedied in that manner, and should. Yeah. Um, a, I think it's. I don't know how we ensure that our colleagues understand the seriousness of the conflict of interest act and. When we ask if there's an interest, it's very important that you declare what the interest is, even if you think it's nominal, because we, our clerks can't do their job, our legal staff can't do their job if they're not aware of what's going on. Um, B, in terms of losing a quorum, it becomes a big hoopla -pla, normally because some people are trying to make hay out of it, but given the number of committees that people are sitting on, I'm surprised we don't lose quorum more often because we do get conflicts from time to time. And it may not be a municipal committee. We, we sit on other committees within, you know, I five different committees in my community that I have to attend meetings on that, you know, so it, it's, a, it's always a bit of a challenge. Um, the quickest solution is if we recess and move on to the next, you set another date and continue on from there. Now, how do we educate people about the pecuniary interest side? Because that is going to be Peculiarly interesting. As of today? Yeah, well, I was just going to say. <laughs> I, I think for, I, I'm just, my words, not yours, Lisa, but prior to today's decision in the courts, I think many municipal politicians have taken that particular issue rather lightly. My words. So, how do we ensure that from now on we're not taking those things lightly? So I think two things. Number one is that uh, is in the orientation for the new council, very clearly that needs to be built on that particular issue. And I think councillor didn't help Rob Ford. No, well, but you have to want to hear it and understand it. Um, I think kind of with the the evolution and in view of uh, what's transpired today is I think every fresher for uh, for us in, uh, in in GIC might be appropriate a midterm um, uh, thing and then the balance is the onus is on the uh, is, is on the elected member of council to stay well and do the things we should make a, a, and I'd be happy to I guess make that recommendation that we would hold a workshop on it for sure um, and I don't think we need to bring the outside legal counsel we have um, more than sufficient legislative staff and legal counsel here that can explain pecuniary interest and, and provide the correct advice to the counselors. Um, I hope we can form. Mm -hmm. Just through the chair to yes, say please. that um, certainly the general advice and the orientation can be provided, but um, uh, legal staff and clerks can't provide advice to individual counselors. Only the I just want um, to yeah. repeat that. And it was a mention to the report on that. And it's actually in the decision of today. But I think we treat it as we, we treat it as orientation for mm -hmm. for everyone and, uh, and and I think beginning of term and I'm gonna say as circumstances evolve in view of some decisions. I mean we've got uh, we still have the Mississauga situation that, um, to be rendered, so circumstances may change yet again. No, the judgments may change, the law doesn't change. Yeah, right, right. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, councillor, councillors, could I have some direction on this? This is, a, is this an information report, but if you... Uh, uh, I would move that we receive it and recommend to AFNA that they suggest council hold a workshop on 
um, declarations of interest and pecuniary interest. So this one helped me. I think it goes back to G. It's a referral from General Issues Committee. So do we still report back to AF and A to Council? And we've we've achieved the the direction of uh, of uh, GIC. Okay. Councilor Basuda, anything additional? I just maybe I'm getting away from this, but the question is: we have standing committees, and we have quorum, and then we lose quorum, particularly when we have somebody a delegation in. Is the meeting to stop at that point? I know, Lisa, we discussed this. Uh, three Thirty minutes. minutes. Thirty minutes to achieve quorum. But the meeting stops. In the meantime, the delegation stops speaking. Mr. Chair, we have um, provided, uh, we have indicated that you can receive information as long as you're not making any decisions, that you need a quorum to make a decision. So uh, depending on what the issue is, it would be a, you know, sort of a very specific to that situation when you do lose the quorum. That you'd be a recess until you gain quorum or you just receive information. So when we're getting a report from staff and we lose quorum, the staff can continue giving their report and I don't have a problem with that because you usually have the document from staff in advance anyway, so if the council is deeply room to go whatever and they come back, you know, then, but I, I've always had an issue when I'm in the chair and we lose quorum and it's a delegate. Uh, you know, I stop. I don't, I'm not having the delegate speak to less than quorum, it's highly insulting. It's not what the process is about. So uh, it really is up to each individual. But I think counselors have to be, um, and the clerks, and, and I haven't talked to the clerks about this, but I know for a fact that they worked at Bundock trying to ensure quorum. We talked to them here today. Um, you know, and I knew you were really tight, and I, I made it here for the, for the meeting. Um, and so I've done that many times with with the clerk's office, but I think the counselors have to make sure that they understand if they got something that's going to create a conflict later in the day, they have to tell them at some point so they know in advance that we're on four o'clock, we're going to lose corn, as opposed to at 345, you realize you're losing corn. It's not that hard to do. I said it, not you guys. <laughs> but based on my um, ample responsibilities, I share with the, with the clerk and the member and the legislative assistance of the various committees yep. if I'm not going to be in attendance or which which part if it you know it's it, it's, it's common courtesy yep. to do that and as a result if things are a little tight then they start to firm up their uh, firm up their numbers they knew my schedule better than my wife knows my schedule for God's sake so <laughs> yeah she told me about that <laughs> And she likes that. You no, know, they get talking about some other things and there's a camera going through it. Right as I turn red. Okay, so we have a uh, we, we have a, a, a motion. Councilor. Sorry, I was Ms. Gallagher. Councilor Gallagher, yes. Sorry. I wasn't going to do the motion. Sorry for you, Mr. Chair. Just so that we have clarification for our legislative staff and committees, will we leave it to the specific committee chair whether or not they will recess the meeting as in... Councillor Clark's case when he was uh, speaking to delegations and still allow our legislative staff to continue recording the uh, proceedings of the meeting without quorum. I just wanted to confirm what it is I'm going to be telling them after we leave this meeting. Well, I think two things. We've got a, we've got a motion that will find its way out of AFNA and you're looking for direction Correct. of staff. Councillor Clark? Well, um, it's my understanding that the clerks provide advice to the chair and to the chair only, and then the chair has to make the decision. The chair can decide to continue and listen if that's the chair's call, and that's the chair's call. But the chair could also go to the members of the committee and ask them. But it's at the end of the day, it's still the chair's yeah, call. Exactly, perfect. So that's you guys still provide advice to the chair, and you go from there. Mr. Chair, we will inform the chair that we have lost quorum, and then we will leave that to the chair to decide. Exactly. Perfect. Good. Good. And you're okay otherwise, Chris? Okay, so on the motion, all those in favor? Carried. Opposed? The motion carried. Item 4.3 is the electronic recording of closed session meetings. Councillor Clark? Yeah, um, 
I understand very well why our legal staff provided this document uh, in camera, and we, as a committee here, can't make it public because we're not counsel. Um, but I don't have any concerns about discussing the matter in public. I'm not going to be referencing the legal advice within the document. Um, I think it would probably be in the best interest of transparency that if we were going to have any discussions on electric record, electronic recording of closed session meetings that we would do that in public. So a couple of suggestions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we could receive the document with no comments, refer it up the line chain of command where eventually it'll get to council or the FA. Um, it, as I understand it, it's only council that can make this public. It's not AFA or anyone like that. We can't rule that this is a public document, correct? It's only council that has that authority. Right? So it has to eventually get to them. To Ms. Make Gallagher? This. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to confirm that the public report that we do have within the agenda, we will be speaking to um, many of the issues. Um, I think Ron, and I won't speak for Ron, because Ron can do that himself. Um, was specifically to address his legal opinion with respect yep. to the report that clerks had prepared. Yep. So the majority of our discussion, you are correct, can be held in open session. Yeah. And, and, and I don't, so, yeah. so I don't really see any need to go in camera, and this we would just keep confidential until it goes up the chain of command, and they can decide whether or not it ever becomes a public document. But my read of this is this is um, the solicitor's best advice in terms of protecting the corporate's best interests um, regarding um, closed minutes, which was an excellent read. Ron, did you have any desire to say anything in? Uh... Um, no, I would have uh, if he wanted me to done a presentation in camera, but I'm fine with the committee making its own decision on the process. Uh, I, I would just ask the chair if they could note that it was received as a in mm -hmm. camera report, private confidential. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so, gentlemen, back to you. Direction, please. There is no motion. Uh, um, basically, uh, we are. Uh, re responding to the possibility of the recording of closed session meetings and the uh, and in all cases yeah, the may, are outlined here. Um, there's no recommendations to it, but I, I, I think the next step if we were going to contemplate that would be to, to look at policies as to how it would work. Would that not be a fair statement? Correct. Um, I I can only tell you that, that it's my experience that is, as in terms of, of, of what the Ombudsman is doing in open meetings and transparency, that we're going to see the pendulum swing um, pretty widely. And he has already indicated in his last report that um, closed minutes or closed session minutes should be um, almost transcribed as in a courtroom so that if he's making a decision at a later time, he can make a decision accordingly. Because right now, he's really making a decision based on hearsay and hearsay only. That's all he's got. And that can cut both ways. Hearsay can, can damn a counsel, and we're in camera inappropriately. Or hearsay can actually save us. But if there's actual a record, and I think many times, uh, many meetings where we have stopped, you, I know you've done it frequently, uh, Mr. Chairman, and we've looked to the clerk and we said, I'm sorry, I don't think we're on, and we've, we've stopped counselors from talking about issues that they brought up. You know, a counselor gets heated in the moment and starts to go down a path, and that's not, a, it's not on the agenda, and we didn't go on camera for that, so you, we can't discuss that. So this body does that now. Um, it would be interesting to see how we can 
um, if there's any way of, of, of protecting ourselves from those documents being utilized in litigation. I don't think there is uh, such a method from my understanding, and I think Ron covered that. But I think we should move forward with the development of some type of, of policy on it and have council decide, do they want to go down this road? Pragmatically, it's as simple as having a digital recorder hooked into the main board, and when you close the doors and everything's, you hit the button, then it's not recording. It's really that simple, and then you just keep, it, it would transcribe the date automatically, and just keep it, and there's nothing that you have to type or anything, it's, so it would be very simple in terms of the clerks. Um, the policy would have to, the policy would have to uh, cover off who gains access to those minutes and at what appropriate times. Um, it's not something that, in my opinion, an elected member should be able to go to the, the and say, I want to listen to the closed minutes because I knew he said that and that's not what he said. That kind of vexatious political BS. Those minutes are meant to protect the public to ensure that we are being transparent. And they should only be utilized in that manner for nothing else. So you'd want to have the policy that says very clearly that we're going to take the, the proceedings of closed sessions. You'd want to have the policy that says that the recordings of these closed sessions are only for the use um, in ensuring transparency um, uh, of the Sunshine Law, I guess is what the Ombudsman is now calling. Yes. Yes. Um, and they're to be maintained for a period of time. I'm not sure how long you'd have to keep them. Okay, so pr procedurally we are responding to a council direction. So would it go back to GIC or straight to council? A Still the AFNA. Okay. So perhaps what we could do is we could certainly uh, re Receive the report. Yes. Um, give direction. Sorry, receive rich report. Staff the, the, report. Yes. Okay. This one. So receive the four, the, the four, the four point uh, four point three public report. Mm -hmm. um, send it to AFNA with the, the addition that staff be directed to develop um, a. Um, uh, I'm going to call it a process for the electronic collection of uh, of. Uh, information from closed um, session meetings and uh, that the process be reported back to, I guess it would be back to AFNA or GIC? AFNA. AFNA, okay. okay. So we want to make sure that the process uh, identifies that there's a policy for the utilization of the information and, as well as the dissemination. Yeah. Somehow, Ron, we would have to say, we don't just hand it up to anyone. Someone calls from the Ombudsman office, says they're in the Ombudsman office. No, there has to be a process that we verify that we're distributing to who we should be distributing it to. Okay, then, sorry, then through you, Mr. Chair, would um, it be better for us to bring that policy back to governance before we take it to AFNA? And yeah, have cool, the matter right. remain with governance until we're ready to go forward. Okay, so why don't we just why don't we just receive this report and uh, and, and go back and do some more homework in view of the uh, of, of of the discussions that took place today, and then come back to us before we go to AFNA. Yep, sounds good. You okay with that? I think it's important that we do it the right way. Yeah, it's complicated. Yes. So, Council Pursuit, can I have that motion? And the motion that states the staff and the report back. Yep. The next appropriate uh, yep. governance committee meeting. And then we receive the confidential advice provided by the solicitor and remain confidential. So, on that motion, all those in favor? Carried. Opposed? The motion is carried. Um, any OBLs to come off in view of what we've done, uh, Christopher? I think so.
so that would be uh, Q1 of 20, 2013 would be the new date on the So the motion would be to delete A and C and change the uh, our, the next due date for Part D. On the motion, Pasuda, Clark, all in favor? Sure. Terry. Uh, my item under new business is uh, in discussion with one of the legislative assistants. There's there's a challenge at the AFNA committee. The core the uh, the number of committee members is five. Um, doesn't take too many people to cause some challenges for quorum. So what uh, the suggestion is that before the end of this term, we do a review of the numbers on the standing committees of, of council and uh, and modify where appropriate. So if we could just uh, put that on our future agenda, and staff will bring it back. That's a my occurrence for my colleagues. Well, we are doing that annually anyways before the next term. Correct. So I, That's a good idea. I specifically identified the AFNA, which uh, we've uh, we've made it, but it's been challenges. Any other business? Anyone else? Motion stand adjourned. Pasuda Clark, all in favor? Terry. Thanks, everyone. Great work in your reports and that. And uh, there's some other things, a few things off the water for for okay. governance. So. Yeah, for a second.